So today we're still in the midst of editing some new episodes. Super excited for those to come out. But in the meantime, I have an old episode for you from the archives. It's one I did with Caleb Simpson. Great interview. Since interviewing him, he's grown another million followers on TikTok, another half million on YouTube, and has interviewed the likes of Drew Barrymore and Jacob Collier. He's doing big stuff. So without further ado, here is Caleb Simpson's episode. Boom, all of a sudden, Barbara Corcoran's in my fucking DMs. Barbara Corcoran is a host on Shark Tank. She's also has Corcoran Group that she sold for like $70 million. She was like the queen of New York City real estate for a yeah. period of time. Yeah, she's huge. And I was like, what the hell? And I look at it and she's like, I've seen your videos. I'd love for you to come tour my apartment. And I just like look at my roommate, Haley. I'm like, dude, Barbara Corcoran just DM me to come tour her apartment. And then everyone's seen that video, that the video did like 100 million views national news all of a sudden like i'm on tv like all this shit's happening and then all of a sudden like a lot of people want to be in the videos and it's like okay like what the fuck is going on it starts with just taking that leap man you have to work hard you have to be incredibly smart do something that even if it fails even if it fails you are going to be proud of it doesn't matter how badly you got beaten in that be kind be kind be kind become a better person a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. <laughs> I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. It's not every day Barbara Corcoran slides into your DMs, but for Caleb Simpson, this was suddenly the new normal. Now, if this name sounds familiar at all, it's because you've probably met Caleb before on your For You page, or on YouTube Shorts, or anywhere short form content exists. Known for his casual house tours and the signature question, how does she pay for rent? Caleb has amassed over 7.1 million followers on TikTok and 2 million YouTube subscribers in the past few years. Traveling from house to house in New York to LA to Tokyo to Hong Kong, he isn't afraid to test out a stranger's bed or play with your pets or listen to a SoundCloud music sample. But while these videos seem to go viral in an instant, Caleb's journey to filmmaking was anything but easy. From finding odd jobs on Craigslist to sleeping behind a curtain in someone's living room, Caleb had to build his skill set from the ground up while learning how to survive in New York City. And before TikTok was even invented, before Caleb first picked up a camera, his journey started in the unlikeliest of places, being homeschooled amongst his eight other siblings. I want to start before you were the... Hey, uh, <laughs> I was your favorite rent in New York City guy. Um, I want to go and start at the very beginning. Uh, and maybe you could tell me what it was like to to grow up with a, a whole bunch of siblings. Yeah, so I'm. Where are you of, in the lineup? I'm one of nine kids from the from the same parents. Yeah, my mom. She uh, she had nine kids. My goodness, that's insane, right? She okay. Yeah, she is okay. You know, one time I was like home from college and I was like chatting with my mom about it. I was like, everyone always says like, yo, your mom's a saint. How did she have nine kids? And she was like, honestly, Caleb, like after I had your your youngest sister, like down there, like it was like, I said, like, mom, stop talking. <laughs> Please spare me. <laughs> spare me from what you're about to say. Yeah. And she's like, just, I probably couldn't have another kid, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I believe it. Like it's a lot. Um, yeah, I'm the middle child, so I have oh, two wow. older brothers, two older sisters, two younger brothers, and two younger sisters. Well, you're smack dab in the middle. Yeah. Wow. What is that like? What's Because like, I've heard like middle child of like three, but middle child of nine. Like, What is your responsibility or role within that in your family? Yeah. Um, I was like kind of like a goofy, playful kid, I would say. Um, I, it was fun because I got to see both sides of like the spectrum of my siblings. So, like, my youngest sister never hung out with my oldest brother. Like, he's just some this weird adult that's, like, out there in the world. <laughs> you know, she doesn't even know him. Yeah. Like, she'll go over and see him and shit. But he's, like, uh, an uncle more than a brother because she didn't grow up with him. So, I think being the middle child is cool because I got to, like, hang out with my older brother at home and my younger sister, if that makes sense. Did you grow up, like, religious or anything? I grew up very religious and homeschooled. Really? That's a very uh, unique combination totally because right. i feel like that gives your parents full control to shape you guys into whatever they want yeah for sure um yeah i grew up homeschooled religious but i have i really love just sports so i always wanted to go to public school because they had sports teams i would play like with like the the local rec in my town whatever that was like basketball and stuff like that but those leagues kind of ended once you're a little bit older um so that was my main interest when i was younger i just loved playing games 
I love playing. I didn't like school. Anything that involved a game and running around and laughing, I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> Did you feel like, I don't know, socially stunted at all looking back? Honestly, it forced me to get out of the house and go meet people. I was always uh -huh. like mad curious, like what was going on outside of home. Looking back on it, I was like very social. Anytime I could get out and go hang out with people, I was like down. Did you, were you like a, a good religious boy or were you a little <laughs> wild? I would say yes for a good while. Up until I was like 12, 13. What changed? You know, you start to question things. You're yeah. like, what, why are these people saying these things to me? But I, I think it was more of like after like 17, 18, I wasn't really going to church or anything anymore. So like what communities did you start investing in if that, you know, wasn't the one? Tennis. I started playing tennis when I was 12 and then played pretty seriously up until like 17, 18. When did you get into like videos? Like either like editing or filming or just like touching any kind of video equipment. It was, we had this little point shoot camera and I shot a video when I was like 15 in the snow. We like built a snowman. We put a dick on the snowman. Ah, dude, classic. Yeah, classic. <laughs> put it on Facebook, you know? And then I just loved watching YouTube. There was like YouTubers that I just found really funny. You're, you're you know, getting up like you're like 15, 16, 17, like thinking about maybe a little bit of like college or what either what comes after high school so like what were you thinking you wanted to do with your life or was that even a thought at that time uh professional sports like really? I, so yeah. tennis was like super serious yeah i wasn't as good as i thought i was but like <laughs> just sports in general yeah. i was like i love sports but uh i didn't realize the level of dedication it took to become a professional athlete or do anything at the top top one percent i remember having this thought of well i guess only a few people go viral you know and, and then I just like let that idea, idea pass. Because it seems like you found the thing that you are doing now actually pretty early, right? Like you, I mean, you're, 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 you make videos for a living now and you're, you're a personality and you go viral daily. Um, and you found that like, you know, 14, 15, 16. Um, why do you think you let it go? I think it had to do with the beliefs in my own head. Like I didn't grow up with, much at all so like the idea of being able to create my own life or make a lot of money or become famous or travel around the world like traveling around the world was like the most distant idea ever in my head like i was like i'll never be able to afford to do that so i had to come over like overcome all these roadblocks before i could like unlock what i wanted to do how did you start overcoming some of those uh well when i first like left home and went to college that was like whoa like i'm gone I joined a frat like immediately. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was only like 2000 kids at my school. I remember dropping off, like my parents dropped me off and I was just like looking at the dorm room, like, yo, this nah. is it. <laughs> like I'm here, but not in like a excited way. More of like, I was hella nervous. I think just no home base. Like I knew I was on my own, like with, with my upbringing also, like, uh, I knew there's no going back also. Like uh, some of my siblings got kicked out. Like none of them, no one was allowed to go back home. Yeah, so it was one of those things. So I was, like, nervous, like, okay, I have to make this work because, like, there's no going back now. I can only go forward. I did well my first year in college. Like, yeah. you know, I had, like, a B plus, three, three, five or something. But then uh, sophomore year, went all downhill. I was just partying, like, every day. Got put on academic probation. Still didn't really care. And then junior year, it was, like, I had to really decide, like, oh, are you going to get kicked out of school or are you going to, like, focus and, like, get through it? So that's that was like a tipping point for me mentally of like overcoming an obstacle, as I should say, uh, where I made a clear decision. I'm going to graduate school. So let me at least get like a C plus. Did you change your your habits and your environment? Did you just change your habits? Like how did you develop the uh, structure you needed to to not flunk out? I didn't change either the environment or the habits <laughs> <laughs> and this time around. Um I just went to class more. The first part of the semester, I'd slack off, and then I would do all the calculations of exactly what I needed to do to graduate or to pass. Yeah. I was like, oh shit, I gotta buckle down. <laughs> so then I would like lay off partying some yeah. and go to class and make sure I'm doing the test. So you're about to graduate. Uh, is the sinking feeling of not being able to go back to your parents' place, is it, is it a little less now? Or are you like, oh shit, I'm about to graduate. I'm in debt. 
Like, what do I do? Like, yeah. So, I mean, I was about to graduate. Um, I was a super senior, by the way. Yeah. Uh, took five years, one year of solid party. <laughs> <laughs> that year, I was like, I'm going to party this entire year because I only had two classes. One the first semester and one the second semester. Oh my yeah, I needed to graduate. So I was just working at a restaurant and I was like, I'm going to party every day this year because this is going to be easier. It was. It was fun. The lease ended and I moved into this guy's apartment that uh, I was working with. I was like, yo, let me just stay here for like three weeks or two weeks. So what happened was I was actually like in the Walmart parking lot in Fayetteville, North Carolina, in a car with no air conditioning. It was like 90 degrees that day. Okay. Got a phone call from this guy who managed a tennis club in New York City. They were like, hey, we're looking for someone to manage a tennis club. Will you like come to New York City and interview for the position? Showed up in a suit, bro, to this tennis this... club. I had no idea <laughs> did, what I was did doing. Did you bring a racket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> racket in a suit and then just did the interview. Uh, obviously way way out of my comfort zone but like once i got there and worked there for like a year i was like they would have fucking hired anyone <laughs> yeah, anyone with a pulse yeah yeah and a racket yeah exactly and a suit. <laughs> yeah fresh guy out of college like yeah. of course they didn't want want me but uh so you I, moved to new york yeah for this job on my way back to the airport they called me and then they're like you got the job and we want you to start next week next cool. week yeah and i was like fuck like i have no money i don't know where to live i don't know new york city at all like what am i gonna do I had a thousand bucks in my bank account uh, that my parents gave me graciously. I don't even know where they got that from because I don't think they had it. Um, this woman that worked at the tennis club as well, she, her daughter just left to go to school. She's like, you can stay in her room for two months and then wow. you got to find a spot. What is it like trying to find an apartment in New York City? <laughs> Nerve wracking, bro. If you don't know New York, you're like, who are these people? What are these neighborhoods? Am I getting ripped off? But I... Obviously, first thing you do is send it out to your network of people that you know. And a friend of a friend was like, we know this old guy who lives in the West Village. And he's like, and I slept on his floor before. Maybe he'll let you stay there. Living in the West Village. Just like went and met him. And then he's like, yeah, you can stay in the living room. Uh, so I, I just like put down a bed in the living room and paid him 600 bucks a month. When do you start making some plans of what the heck you want to do so you don't have to sleep on the floor in a 100 square foot section of some... Uh, dude's living room. I was like, let's figure out the job for three months. Okay, I figured out the job. Then I was like, okay, how do I make more money? And I was, a I was able to teach lessons at the tennis club too. So like on weekends or whenever I had free time, I would do lessons to make some extra money. So then I would, I don't know, make an extra like 12 grand a year there. So I was so, like, okay, cool. Well, I study business and all my friends go into, you know, sales or business yeah. roles. So let me yeah, start. You really paid attention. Like one of my frat bros like worked in New York City at K Force, which is uh hmm. like the number one recruiting firm. So I just like started, I was like, okay, that's the path he went. Let me just start interviewing with all these like recruiting firms and all these companies. And I did like 20 interviews with like 20 different companies. And I was like, then I did one with his company. He got me an interview. And this woman sat me down and she's like, I like you, Caleb, but I don't think you like want to be here. She's like, you know what a real day is like at this at this job? Let me tell you. She's like, I wake up with pure dread in my fucking stomach because of all the pressure and how hard this job is. And I, I go to bed, I work 10, 12 hours a day. Making this job is my life. And like, this is what it is. And is that the life you want? And I was like, wow, thanks for being honest with me. And I was like, uh, and I kind of looked at her and I was, I said, you know, I don't want this job. I don't want this life. I was like, I don't want that. And she's like, this is why I told you what it really is. She's like, I would have pushed you through to the next round, but like, I'm happy you're telling me this now so we don't spend any more time on you. And I was like, cool. And I went home and threw out all my suits. I was like, fuck corporate America. <laughs> I was like, I'm not living my life that way. And that's when I started. I was like, I'm going to learn uh, shit with a camera. So I just, That was the moment. That was like the moment, yeah. The origin story. Yeah. Wow. The first video I ever filmed in New York was like, I like playing basketball. So I'd always play pickup basketball and shit. So I just like went and filmed like a little video of me shooting hoops. And I like chopped together like, you know, seven cuts in the video editing software. Like showed some people at the tennis club and they're like, whoa, that's pretty good. And they're like, you going to go to film school? I was like, I hate school. And this is the first time I wanted to learn. So no, I'm not going to go to film school. So I sought out like mentors in New York. How do you fully invest in this? Well, I think you start tugging at the strings that are around you that are obvious. So like one of my friends at the tennis club, Irving, shout out Irving, long time homie. His girlfriend at the time was a filmmaker. So I was like, can I like have a conversation with her? Can she show me some things? And then she spent like 
an hour with me filming some shit. I was like, <laughs> let's just go film some shit in the park. And she's just looking at me like, this fucking guy. <laughs> I don't want to film your pickup basketball game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just had no clue. So yeah. I was like, well, let's just grab my skateboard and let's just like film some shit around. Um, so she spent like an hour with me. And the best piece of advice that she gave me was, do not hit me up again for an entire year. She said, go make some shit. And if you're still making shit, I'll help you more. And I was like, damn, okay. Like, I got to make shit for a year. How did that advice affect you in the moment? Was it like, did it feel like she was blowing you off? Or did it feel like, no, this is actually advice that I can act on right now? It, it felt like I needed to do more. It was just like, you, you need to go make more shit. She's like, and then, and then she told me it takes five years. She's like, to get a real career in here, it's going to take you five years. So it's interesting. I uh, saved up to buy a laptop, you know, so I could get a editing software. Then my objective was to, I just start taking pictures a lot and then making videos, just filming stuff around. And like my, every day when I got home, I would drink a coffee and try to edit one video, mm. whatever that, not even edit one video, learn one new editing trick in the software. So I'd go on YouTube and I didn't even know what to search. I didn't even know what it was called. You know what I'm saying? That was the hardest part. It's like going in YouTube and I'm like, this effect, what the fuck is this effect called? I don't know. So I just started going through, going through, going through. Oh, I found it. Okay, let me learn this one effect. It was like what I recognized is the information is there. I just uh -huh. like need to learn the words and how to find it. Yeah. And so and then it was a deep, dark journey of just like learning how to find information. Yeah. So I'm uh -huh. a big believer in tech and YouTube and the internet. And some people argue the point of like, well, the information is not easy enough. But I'm like, well, I taught myself an entire career through YouTube in my free time. So like, I know you can too, cause I didn't know shit and I was the worst student ever. I realized like I needed a mentor. I needed someone to learn from. So I started reaching out to people like on Instagram and I texted this guy, Bobby, who was like a fashion influencer guy uh -huh. who made videos. And I just DM them. I said, Hey, can I come work for you? And like learn, which is like hella nerve wracking for me. And then he was like, sure. Wait, was, what? Yeah. It was like within a couple of days, like all this happened. No way. Really? But I was just like, hey, I just want to learn. Like, I'll come work for you for free. Yeah. I think it was like Gary V, you know, who's like, go work for people for free. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fuck it. Let me go do that. So he was kind of like my first mentor. Wow. And that kind of like made me realize like, oh shit, people will teach you stuff if you go ask them. You know, like they really will if you are actually interested. Yeah. And you actually commit to, to learning the information that they yeah, teach you. Commit to showing up, really. Yeah. Show up and do the work. Uh -huh. So then I was like learning how to edit and stuff. So there was a skateboard race that happens every year in New York City. It's called the Broadway Bomb. Yeah. It's uh, the third Saturday of every October. I was like, I'm going to film it this year because I skated it two years. And I had like got a Canon 70D. I was like, let me film it this year. That'll be sick. And I met this guy who, I don't know, he saw me with the camera. And it was a big camera. It was a nice camera at the time, quote unquote. He saw me filming it and then I filmed it and put it on YouTube. It was like, okay. Yeah. But he was like, hey, I'm filming with this famous Instagram fitness influencer in New York. And I, I saw you at the Broadway bomb. And then I saw your video. I thought it was decent. It's like, you want to come film her video? And I was like, holy shit. Like, my big break. Yeah, no, it was literally like my big break yeah. moment. Like my heart like dropped into my stomach. She had like a million followers on Instagram. Shit. I was like, holy shit, this is my opportunity to make it. Oh, my God. <laughs> how how long was that after your homie's girlfriend was like, yo, t t tell me in a year? Maybe like a year, okay. a year and a half, yeah. Okay. So I, I had to work that day, but I like called out or some shit. Yeah. I was like, yo, yo I can't make it till like 5 o'clock or something. <laughs> so I just went and filmed it, was like mad nervous. It was just like a little recap video, you mm -hmm. know? And then they're like, we need it like tomorrow. So then I like blew off work again to go edit it. It was just like editing it, editing it. And I was like, okay, I think this is good. I think this is good. Sent it off. And they're like, yeah, we like it. They posted it. And I got a million views on her page. No way. Yeah. And I was like, Dude, oh my God. Yeah. A video that I made has a million yeah. views. This is fucking insane. Your first viral moment, dude. Yeah. And I was like, I made that. Like, yeah. That is so sick. Yeah. You know? I think that was like the first like really big, big one. Yeah. Like something you created is like out in the world yeah and had nothing to i mean looking back on it now is she could have posted anything got a million views <laughs> you know what i'm saying but like for me it was a big big moment you no know? that's huge that's huge so moving from that like did you realize i mean it, 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 it seems like you realize the power of instagram in that moment it did feel like a big moment but also it just 
it was fleeting. You know, it was kind of just like over. It was like, okay, what's next? You know? Did they not hit you up for another video? No, no, no. I mean, what she else? was just in town for like a meet and greet, and then that was it. So, then I was back to the tennis club. Were you just like, fuck? Like, like I feel like I feel like after having like that the high of editing a video, getting noticed, and then having the video blow up, and then going back to like maybe the thing that you're not as passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it took a long time. Like, uh, that period of time when I was working at the tennis club for like three years was like a long, dark rut, basically. Huh. Of me just being like, what the hell is going on? Trying to make videos and not working, trying to take photos, partying a lot. Like, I was partying a lot too, then like going to the tennis club. I was just like kind of upset, you know? I was just annoyed. Yeah. I was just annoyed because I thought it was supposed to all happen faster or whatever. I had these like miss guided ideas about what life was supposed to be i think at that time wait yeah can we can we dive into like the partying and dating a little bit like sure do you think it was contributing to your unhappiness i think i was just doing it because that's what i knew because uh. i knew it from school and it was uh -huh. like my social outlet this is where i was like meeting people stuff like that so i hadn't really taken any time to think about my own life or process any information also like even reeling it back a little bit more, like my dad had cancer when I moved to New York and like died six months into me in my my New York City trip. So like all of this is happening all at the same time. Pretty chaotic. How did you deal with your dad dying? Partying with friends. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, that That's really when I started my health wellness mindset journey was when I, well, I didn't have a good relationship with him, but I still couldn't feel any emotion towards it. There was two things that happened. I couldn't feel any emotion towards it. And then when it happened, I thought, oh God, it's going to end. And then I, I really started like trying to live life to the fullest. What do you mean it's going to end? Like life. Like it was like a wake up call for me. It's like, shit, if you want to do something, you got to fucking do it today, bro. So that's when I started like deep diving into the like health, wellness, mindset space more. Mm. Like learning about like emotions, feelings. I started listening to more podcasts. I was like, how do I like deal with this shit? What did you learn? Well, the first thing I started doing was just running all the time. And yeah. uh, uh, people ask me, like, why do you run? And I said, I'm running for my problems. <laughs> I'm running for my problems. Uh, it's just like an easy way to process. But I was going to say, before we got into this, the biggest growth period was like the year. I decided to take a year off from like partying and going out. Mm. And that was when I saw like the biggest shift in like my creative ability. Because I really did just go home and edit every day. Mm. I was like, let me just do this. Let me just focus on this. Let me focus on myself. You was know? it like lonely? It was the loneliest period of my entire life. For sure. How did you, how did you keep doing it? I just thought, honestly, I just still had this mindset of there was no going back home. I like had this mindset of I'll be like homeless in, in the dirt in New York or I'll make it. Like that was like my literal thought. Like I was just like, I'm going to be homeless or I'm going to make it here. Like that's the only way. Wow. Yeah. And, I, and there were so many times where I like called my brother during this period of time and I was just like crying. Like, yo, I can't do this shit anymore. Like this is too much. What did he tell you? Just like, yo, it's okay. Like, if you need any help, ask for help. Uh -huh. It took me a long time to learn how to ask for help. On on my uh, mindset journey, I did, there was like this app that uh, Lewis Howes suggested. He had some guests on. It was like dealing with a toxic thought. And uh, it was like a 60-day thing that you had to go through every day. Hmm. It was like deconstructing your toxic thought. So it was like figuring out what it was. So I like wrote down like 20 things and it all led back to like, what's the point? So I had to, I was like, okay, well, I guess that's my toxic thought. I kind of think that every time I hit like a certain level of anything, I would get like decent at something. I'd be like, what's the point of getting better? Because yeah. I, I think I had this roadblock. No, I know I had this roadblock in my head that I would be denied if I tried to get any better at it. So I went through all this shit in this app and then I realized like, oh, fuck. You know, when I was younger all the time, like I was always just told no and I'm applying this to my life now. And then that was kind of like a big shift for me uh, emotionally and allowing myself to go after the things I wanted mm. at a much larger scale. Cause I, and I just like told myself like, Caleb, it's okay to ask. And like, no one's going to fucking tell you no. And if they do, we'll ask somebody else. That's really cool. Maybe we can start going towards the, the Instagrammer story. So you're 26 and you're looking for jobs on Craigslist. Looking for jobs on Craigslist. There's this guy who was like, Yo, I'm looking for a travel videographer. I was like, okay, let me apply. So I had like five videos or four videos and I sent it to him. 
and some photos I took. And then he's like, oh, these are cool. Let's have an interview. It's like, shit. Oh, my God. I have an interview. So I did the interview, and then he's like, can you come to Dubai next week as a test? And I was like- As a test? Yeah, and I'd never left the country before. I didn't even have, Yo, a, I didn't have a passport. That's some fucking test, bro. I know. So I had to like make this choice, because I had to take a week off from work, which I didn't have, because I had used one of my vacation days yeah. already. My family was like saying, don't do it. I, like didn't have a passport, didn't really have any money. And I'm like nervous as hell. So, but of course I go do it. I'm like, I got to go do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is my was, opportunity, yeah. bro. This is my chance. <laughs> this is my chance. And so I go there for a week. We film. Also, he asked me like for an equipment list. He's like, hey, get whatever equipment you want. I don't know a shit about cameras, bro. I just like shot on a Canon 70D. Yeah. That's all I know. Got this stuff. Had no idea how to use it. So I'm like in Dubai with this brand new Sony camera. I don't know what I'm, I even how to use it. So I'm just like in my hotel room, like going through tutorials, learning <laughs> how to use the camera. It was a nerve wracking week. What did you guys do? We just traveled around. And then he was like, let's make some recap videos and let's shoot a bunch of photos. Yeah. Ultimately. He forced me to become a better photographer because I went and did the photos and like did the video. And he's like, yeah, it's not bad. He's like, I want to hire you. And he's like, I can pay you, I think like 1600 bucks a month. It's not anything. It's not a, like it's barely enough to cover you know, rent and food. Right. But I still could barely cover rent and food anyway. So <laughs> I, I was like, who cares? Let's fuck this tennis job. I'm going to quit. It was a quick leap. It was short lived actually. I only worked with him for like three months. Okay. Wait, what happened? Honestly, he, I just wasn't feeling it. Like I wasn't having a good time with it. It felt like forced. Wow. Well, he was a wannabe influencer. One. So if you don't have like a career already built on it, you're kind of like building new systems. You're trying to figure things out. And it very much felt like that. It felt like he didn't know what he was doing. Mm. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I was like, these two things, it just doesn't feel right. You can't both that. Yeah, exactly. No, seriously. So, like, I trust my gut when I quit my tennis job and went to this, and I trust my gut to quit with him. But then I felt fucked. Because now you don't have your tennis job. I haven't been in New York for three months. Now I'm back in New York. I still had that apartment that I was paying for, 600 bucks a month. So I'm like, okay. Well, I'm committed to this shit now. What the fuck do I do? So now I'm like, I need to find freelance work. Like, how do I do that? Back on Craigslist. Back on <laughs> Craigslist, baby. Back on Instagram. Like, uh, let me look. Searching every day vigorously for job ops. What did you find? Ultimately, I saw this. Somehow, I followed this guy, Matt Ligotti, who used to work at Vayner. Yeah. And uh, he started his own music marketing agency. He's like looking for videographers to shoot this DJ. Like, yo, I'll do it. He's like, send me a video. I'll send him a video. He's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, then I started shooting DJs, like started shooting nightclubs and shit in New York. But like, I couldn't really afford food at this time. So I was like eating uh, ramen noodles and stuff. I'm walking everywhere. So there was like this period of time. And even when I got these DJ jobs, it was like, I went off here. I went off there. How did you feel during this time? There was two things going on at that time. One, I was like totally destroyed on the inside. What the fuck am I doing here? Uh -huh. Two, there was this guy going kind of viral in New York City on Instagram, Prince Z. He had like 20,000 followers, so I just DM'd him. I was like, let me come make videos for you. Uh, so I started just making videos for him for free as I was doing these other odd jobs. I had these ideas, and he's wanted to try them. So that was like really fun. And he was like becoming more and more viral in New York. So I was like seeing this guy rise, like getting mm -hmm. noticed in New York, and I was like making videos for him. So that was like really fun. I mean, it was interesting. I learned a lot. Was any part of you when you were like, you know, filming these videos thinking I could be in front of the camera? Yeah, like, the whole time. Yeah. I was like, I need to make my own videos, but I didn't really have enough balls to do it. What changed and what gave me a little bit more confidence was this new social media marketing company called Knox Media. They hired me on like part time. So they were paying me three grand a month. To like, make, hey, that's like, up. That's up. That's yeah. like double what you're making before. Yeah, I know. So I was like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> We're back in at 3K a month. So I felt like, oh, I can breathe a little uh -huh. bit. I can breathe a little bit more. I'm learning a lot from them, but I'm still barely making it. But I was like feeling better about everything. And, you know, at this time, you know, TikTok started to come along. Okay. Which was interesting. Do you remember your first interaction with TikTok? Yeah, specifically is with this other guy on social media, Princey, who are coming up with like YouTube ideas. And I was like, everyone on YouTube is making fun of TikTok. I was like, let's make a video, make in front of TikTok. And he's like, well, what should we do? And I was like, well, let's download the app. 
Let's look at the videos that are on there and let's recreate them for a YouTube video in public. So that'd be funny. So we go film that, do that. And then me and him were like looking at this app, TikTok. And I was like, yo, there's some like kids who are like famous now from this app. Like Josh Richards, for example, he had like 2 million followers or something. But he had like a million on Instagram and like 500K on YouTube. I was like, ooh, it translates. And so we're like, bro, I think this is like the thing. This is like TikTok's the thing. So let's like make some videos on here. So that's when we started experimenting. Like me and him started experimenting with TikTok videos at that time. What were your experiments? Well, you know, earlier I said artists think about being an artist in two ways. Yeah. One, you create an original idea that no one's ever seen before. Two, you steal. Hmm. And I'm on the steal side. So we tried just some random ideas and then we're like, this is dumb. Let's look at 20 videos that went viral and let's recreate them. All the prank videos that he was making at the time, though, they were, like, going viral. Like, one of them got, like, 30 million views. And we're like, wow. is this real? But then I was like, well, I want to make some videos. So we did that whole strategy of, like, 20 viral videos. Let's recreate them and see. How did your strategy mature as you made more of these videos? I mean, the, the platform's changed so much. But my strategy initially was... Let's take ideas that are working and then let's 10x those ideas. So my real first viral video, it was like Mentos and Coke was going really viral at that time because a bunch of little kids were on there. And so I was like, all right, let's take like 10 Diet Coke bottles and like 10 Mentos strings and like string them all together, drop them at the same time. They'll explode into the air. Did that and that got like 10 million views. Wow. I was like, holy shit. So the 10x rule worked. So it was like, take an idea that's on TikTok and put it in a new environment or try to make it a bigger concept than what you, everybody's seen. So then it'll go more viral than their video. That was the theory. Was yeah. there any part of you that like returned to that original question where it's like, so what? Uh, yeah, sort of. Because I wasn't really enjoying the content I was making necessarily, but it was working. Like I was like doing Mentos and Cook videos like a bunch because they were just getting like millions of views. How'd that feel though? Like, you know, making cool travel content content that you're more passionate about, but now it's like you're making videos for the 10-year-old audience. I was a joke, bro. What it's like, oh, you're making content on TikTok? That's fucking cute. Oh, that, that silly little app? You're making content there? Oh, you got a few million views on there? Whatever, those are fake. Like, everyone is making fun of us. Like, everybody. everybody. Super interesting. But you believed in it. Why did you believe in it? It had traction with the youth. Mm -hmm. They loved it. And I was also like, I'm getting people, I'm getting noticed over here. Like, why wouldn't I spend more time in here? Instagram, yeah. nothing's happening over there. YouTube's too hard to grow. So let me just, like, spend my time over here. Of the apps, I feel like TikTok revenue is probably the most inconsistent. How did the, the ebbs and flows of that? So hard, dude. Yeah. It was so hard to initially make money on there. Like, one, it just took a long time for brands to get on. So, like, mm -hmm. Bang Energy was, like, the first company to really jump on. And mm -hmm. I landed, like, a Bang Energy deal for, like, 55 grand nice. for a year. Huge. So I was like, hell yeah, let's go. Um, that was like right when COVID started. So I want to go back a little bit. I want to talk about when you're like, this is serious enough that I can quit my real job. So COVID happened. We basically lost like majority of our clients at Knox Media because no one's shooting DJ shows. You know, there's no videos to be edited anymore. So it was like, oh, your retainers like dropped down to like 1100 a month. So I was like, my life was about to go in a completely different direction. And then I was like, yeah, let's do that because I wasn't really making any money on TikTok. And then COVID happened. It was like, let me spend more time on TikTok. And I was like at my brother's house in North Carolina. And then someone like approached me with this Bang Energy deal. It's like, shit. I was like, if I can sign this deal, then I just like secured 50 grand right. for a year. Yeah, I was like, cool, and all I have to do is make one bang energy video a week. That's going to be, like, no time, easy. So ultimately, like, secured that, and then I just, like, called them, and I was like, hey, I, I'm not going to work here anymore. Then they're like, damn, really? And I was like, yeah. So I just, like, went all in on TikTok at that time. When most people were, like, losing their jobs and weren't getting money, I, like, had 4K coming in every month. And so how do you think about what you want to make yeah, I mean, the pressure felt kind of high, honestly, now, because I was like, damn, like, I want to make videos that go viral for this company. And uh, now this is my job, so I need to go viral. Like, it has to work now. Honestly, every minute, all the videos I made up till 
2021, like I didn't necessarily enjoy that much. It was more chasing views and followers. So it was like uh, taxing. Even if I had a video do like 10 million views, I still felt the pressure. I was like, I got to do it again tomorrow. Fuck. Like, is it going to work tomorrow? Who knows? Then I started making money from like a app downloads. So I started making these like dumb little kid videos like buried treasure. Oh, I found a lost GoPro in the lake water. You know what I mean? It was getting like 10, 20 million views. And then I was getting all these app downloads and making money. So I was like, I just made 2K today because I made this little video. So who cares? I'm going to make more of these. But it felt like fleeting at all times. I think you had perfected the art of going viral. And now it was listening maybe a little bit more to what's actually going to be fun for me. Yeah, for sure. Something I could sustain. So basically I get an email from Bang like, we're not going to re-sign with you this year. So I was like, shit, okay, there goes all my money. I need to get a job or another brand deal or something. But I was like hating the videos I was making. And this is the time like NFTs and crypto was taking off. So then I like went and played tennis with my friend Sam, who I worked with before. And I was like, bro, I'm looking to like get in the NFT space, I think. I think that's going to be like the future of media, which I still think it might. And he's like, dude, we're starting a new company and we need someone who knows how to go viral. You want to come work for us and be like our head media guy? And I was like, fuck yeah. They're like, we'll pay you 80 grand a year, like give you a percentage in the company. I was like, health insurance. I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. So I just like stopped making TikTok videos like at that moment in time. And I just like went all in on the startup. I mean, it was a, it was an uphill battle, but like most things, everything has been. Um, it was like, okay, this is a startup with like three founders that are like real professionals who have built real things and sold real things. And I'm like the first hire in the company. I have to manage all these social accounts and make all the content for them. They need to go viral or you're not doing your job. I did like many documentaries for them. So many different things in the storytelling, running their podcast. So you have to build out like systems for this stuff at this point? Sam really built out systems, but I had to build out systems too, yeah. But really it was it was just crazy because the whole thing was like a whirlwind. I didn't know anything about NFTs or crypto. So it was like, okay, now I have to study this space. I have to learn about it so I can talk about it. It's like writing scripts. Let's figure out how to like word these things so these videos go viral. Now I'm an educator in the space. I was on screen. So I kind of became like this viral person in the NFT space and famous. That was my real first touch of like fame in adulthood. So I think working at the startup anyway, it taught me how to like one grind, two, how to learn a whole new industry, three, how to over communicate, be a good communicator, four, how to network because I'm in all these brand new rooms. And like you said, it was a meeting of culture. It was a meeting of celebrities. It was a meeting of tech, of, of money, of art, fine artists, the, the fine art world, all in the same room. And it was just like up to me to meet all these people and connect. So when did it reach like its peak for you? You know, there was like a few moments within just working in the startup culture that were like really difficult for me. And that's just, it's, changes so immensely fast and uh now having like built be, building my own little empire i understand it a little bit more but like directions things people want from you it's doing like 10 12 people's jobs you know at the start it's like hustle grind culture there was a little bit of confrontations like six months eight months a year in where it was like caleb we want this from you and i'm like bro like i'm doing all this shit for you guys like what the fuck so we're like going back and forth a little bit. So I'm kind of realizing like six months in, like, I don't know if this is going to last because like we both are wanting to go in creative different directions. It's like, I feel like I'm giving you guys so much and you just it's want- not enough. It's not, it was just never yeah. enough. So I guess actually how I felt was uh, undervalued. So I realized that like six months in, like, mm, this might not be a lasting thing. So I need to start making content again. So are you like dusting off the old TikTok account? Yeah, yeah. I'm dusting it off, baby. So I start making content again. I was making more content on the weekends, but then me and the company, we hit kind of like a breaking point. So they fired me and they gave me one month severance. So I had like 6K in the bank account. And at that point, I was like, what else do I have to prove to myself? Because like I built these DJs brands online. I built my own brand online. I built a company's brand online. What the fuck else do you got to do, Caleb? You know? So I was ready to build your brand. Yeah, so I was ready. So, and that just taught me like pick up the phone and ask, like, everything's information. So I was calling everybody in, in the world, every creator I've ever met, everybody, what advice do you have? What do you think I should do? What would you what tell yourself? Saying? 
Um, the best piece of advice I got was from Brett Conti, who's a YouTuber. I had like a couple of meetings with him. He said, you know, make, make what you want to see online, like make something you want to see. I was like, that's like a really good piece of advice. And I was trying all these different types of ideas and just like seeing how they made me feel. It's like, if this idea made me feel not that great, I don't want to keep making this video because I know deep down I won't do it. Cause like before, before I quit at it, cause I was like, I don't feel good about it. It's not fun. You know, what was the idea that you eventually landed on? I really thought Sean Rizwan had something. I was like, he has something here. I told him he should go make a show from this, like a podcast, street interview, something. And then I was just like looking at his shit. I just kept looking at it. I was like, there's something in this piece of content. And then he said, he kept on saying like, what's the most expensive thing in your home? I watched his video, I swear, like 20 times. And I was like, what if I asked to go in the home? And that was like a aha moment for me. How do you, like, how does the execution go about? So I hired my friend Billy. We went out and spent the whole day in New York and saying, how much do you pay for rent? Can I have a tour of your home? Like just asking, 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 asking. But I made the rule that I had to do it that day. So this one, like literally the second girl said yes. But I was like, but today. And she's like, no, not today. I'm like, fuck. Okay. So then we just kept going all day asking. Everyone was saying no. And I was like, damn, maybe this is a dumb idea. Feeling really defeated. But I set it up at the very end. I had like ran into a friend. I was like, I'm at least getting a tour to post this as a YouTube video. So we went and tour his home. It was like kind of fun. Posted that YouTube video. That was like 100,000 views on YouTube. That's pretty good. And I took all those little clips of the people saying no or like maybe next week or whatever and just posted them all on social on TikTok. And all those clips went viral. And the craziest part, bro, is that like all the people that said no, their friends all saw it, sent it to them, and then they DM me on Instagram. They said, hey, we'll give you the tour now. So in my head, I'm like, I've never seen the virality like this before. <laughs> Did it work when you were when you started knocking on doors? Yeah. Like, I just started touring around people's apartments, like, going viral, like, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. It's like, what is happening? How are you feeling about, like, just strategizing for this moment? I have to make at least one every day. I have to be in a home every day. And then it was, like, because I was attacking it so aggressively, like, everyone's starting to notice. It was like, boom, all of a sudden, Barbara Corcoran's in my fucking DMs. Can you tell me about that day? Yeah, I think it was only, like, two months into the series or something. I'm like walking down the stairs and I like look at my Instagram account and I see like a DM from Barbara Corkin. I'm like, what the fuck? Barbara Corkin is a host on Shark Tank. She's also has Corcoran Group that she sold for like $70 million. She was like the queen of New York City real estate for a period of time. And she's like, I've seen your videos. I'd love for you to come to my apartment. And I just like look at my roommate Haley. I'm like, dude, Barbara Corcoran just DM me to come to her apartment. And she's like, what the fuck is happening? And I was like, I do not know what's happening, but like, I got to act on this right away. So that was like the tipping point for that. And then it was like, how do I keep everyone interested? Like, mm -hmm. okay, I need to travel to more cities. I need to see more interesting houses. I need to have more interesting guests. Oh, okay, and keep in mind, like this whole period of time between like there to there, it's like money ran out. Like money ran out, virality is going up. Wait, wait, so you're not making money? Well, I had landed some brand deals which would be okay, but they're like 90 days. You know, it's going to take 90 days for me to get paid for them. So like money ran out and I'm like- So you're like famous and broke. I'm famous and broke. I'm like one of the most famous people in New York and just broke. And I'm like, what do I do? Like I got to pay rent. I got to pay these bills. So I, this goes back to like the asking for help thing. I like call my brother. I'm like, bro, I need money. And he's like, what are you talking about? I just saw you on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, he's like, cool. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Actually, he's like, how much you need? So I just like kept asking. I probably borrowed like 10 grand. And then hit them back. So like all of this was like major pressure too. Cause I'm like, the views have to keep going up. These brand deals have to come in. So like my manager at the time, I was, I was talk, calling everybody. Cause I was like the most viral person on the internet for a minute. I was calling these people. They're like, you can charge six figures for a brand deal. Guy that worked at this agency. He's like, listen, this is how it works. He's like, these companies have X amount of marketing dollars. And they're going to give it to 10 creators or they're going to give it to one creator. It's up to you to convince them to give you all the money. He's like, this guy, he like pointed to this comedian who had like 2 million followers. Shitty fucking comedian guy. He's like, we just paid him 120 grand for one video. It wasn't even good. Didn't even get a lot of views. So I fucking was like, okay, take this piece of information. He could be lying to me. I believe him fully though. I was like, let me get more data points. So I call more creators. I, anyone I can get in touch with, I call them. 
how much money have you ever charged? I'm charging a hundred grand per video. Like what? Yeah. You should get, and then they're like, you should, Caleb, honestly, you should get anywhere between 30 and 150 grand for a brand deal. So my manager at the time, I'm like telling her this, I'm like, listen, this is the money we can make. Why aren't we asking for a hundred grand? She's like, it doesn't work like that. It's like, what do you mean it doesn't work like that? She's like, well, there's these like systems and rules you have to go through, build a relationship. And I was like, what the, I like, I remember I slammed my hands down on the table. What the fuck else do I have to do? I was like, you're telling me we can't even ask for $100,000 when I'm the most viral person on the internet. I'm everywhere. I'm in the news. I'm in everyone's mouth. I may never be this viral again in my entire existence of life. And we cannot ask for $100,000 in this moment. Isn't this the moment you ask? She's like, it just doesn't work that way. And I fired her two days later. <laughs> yeah, I was so pissed. I was like, what else you, I, I literally told her, I said, what else do I have to do? What else do I have to do for us? So then, what do you what do you do? Like like now you don't have a manager. I guess you're representing your yourself, or do you find someone else? Well, I at this point I had already called up some other people and it was like, who I asked to manage me. I was like, yo, you guys have done this. You managed these big YouTubers before. You built one of the guys that managed me. Actually, built Boosted Board, Bobby. Um, this other guy. And I was just like, well, let's like do this together. And then they're like, fuck yeah, let's do this together. We're, we're going to make you a shitload of money. And I was like, that's what the attitude I need to hear. Like, come on, let's fucking go. So I kind of, at this point in my life, the amount of time I'm on the phone is like so much because everything's data and information. So I'm like, I need to know who has the most information and who's willing to, who would help. And I realized like it's much better to call and ask somebody than for somebody to be reaching out because everybody and their mother wants to manage me. But it's like, I don't know you. It's like way better to reach out to somebody who you know and trusted and known for five years. I want you to manage me. Are you down to do that? You know? And you have this like cool little relationship. Where is everything today? Like what are you most excited about? Oprah said it best. She's like, the most successful people in the world know exactly what they want. They know exactly what they want to build and who they want to be. So I was like, yes, I'm going viral with these apartment tour things, but what do I want out of this experience? So I was like trying to figure it out for the past six months, like deep diving in other people's careers. I've got like a wall with all my notes of what I care about and what I want. And then it ultimately just came back to like interviewer, host of shows, of a variety show. That's what I want to do. That's what I enjoy the most. So I'll have all my shows built out and then a talk show, and then I can go host other things, like whatever, if I'm at Met Gala or whatever, I'm at the NBA, like just chatting people up. What advice do you think you would give to people at the beginning of their creative journeys? You know, another thing that I really learned in the NFT space, which I forgot to mention, is I got to interview some like really amazing artists who like went from the fine art world to the NFT space. And I got to interview them and sit down and just talk to them. And the through line of all of them was they've made art for 20 or 30 years and they just didn't stop. And then they're still there and everyone else quit. So that's what I would tell them. It's like, hey, just keep making the videos, keep making the shit. Everyone else will fucking quit and you'll still be there and there'll be a small group of you and you will get recognized and you'll most likely get your moment if you keep pushing the envelope of your art. And second thing is like, insert yourself in that culture, whatever it is. That's the biggest one too. Outside of making shit forever, because you love it, is like show up and be there. Be be with the people. If you're there, you're gonna ultimately be accepted because you're fucking there. It's like, oh, he's here making shit. He keeps showing up. He's here, you know? Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our chief of staff and operations is Jessica Lynn. Our audio editing team lead is Adrian Tapia. Support from Irene Van Burkle, Matt Fernandez, Renee B. Cannon, Sophia Donner, David Saidi, Ashley Jimenez, Nicholas Guzman, Aaron Devereaux, Sanessa Gisley, and Lois Choi. Our outreach and research lead is Kenny Ong. With support from Sarah Hobson, Cherise Tan, Harushi Kanauchi, Kristen Hagelin, Aya Cortez, and Valencia Lu. Our writing team lead is Elizabeth Bowen with support from Aiden Ashworth, 
Joaquin Gower, Sylvie Wong, and Eric Menno. Our design team lead is Shruti Ramanand, with support from Tiffany Dang, Yao Liu, and Dina Gabriel. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.